my name is Michelle, and my project was entitled Fueling Cooperation and Creativity. It was all about mapping the renewable alternative energy sources uh, and community empowerment in Chile. So sort of that du dual goal. Um, so first I just wanted to talk about the, my stated goals and how they changed drastically. So my first finding upon arrival is that the area of focus of mine, which is biofuels, had basically imploded since I originally applied for the Fulbright. So um, this happened for various reasons, which I'll get into, but I had to expand a little bit uh, into different types of renewable energy. Um, seeing as a lot of my contacts, some of them didn't really exist anymore, but the overarching goal was to create linkages between the institutions and um, educational hubs that are pre doing research on the renewable energies like biofuels and others, um, and the communities who could benefit from them. Um, and as well as nonprofits and individuals, collectives who um, are all doing their part, but might not actually be on the map. So um, my idea was to distribute the new methods that I learned through education, art, and culture. So um, that gets into my three main axes of the project, which are basically the deliverables that I was focusing on. So um, my goal was to put all of these projects on a map that everybody could access, um, whether they be giant re uh, renewable research at large universities or your local garage biofuel producer. Um, the next was doing workshops and community happenings that would inspire creativity and basically take part in the technog technological diffusion that um, is, I would argue, is lacking um, in getting the word out about the resources that are available. So. I'll go into that, and then lastly, um, I made a, a series of documentary shorts that document the process, which uh, I'll show you one of them. Um, so the first is the map. Um, I was able to use, I didn't use GIS software, I actually used Carto, if any of you have heard of that. Um, and I was able to create uh, downloadable shape files that are now accessible um, using crowdsource data as well as public publicly accessible data but the thing about that the the latter is that even if it's publicly accessible it's not always easy to find um, so I had to dig a little bit but I ended up creating a map which I was gonna hope to show you because it's interactive Can you Technical difficulty. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so this is my website. Um, it's called Space Lab. It's a hub for creative empowerment and platforms for expression. Um, and this is the map, which is, as you can see, can I make it better? Okay, that's okay. Uh, the legend isn't showing up, but here we have all the projects I was able to document, and as you can see, if you click, um, you can get there some more information. And then, uh, um, in the data that I collected, I did a sort a deep multimedia um, exploration of each of the hubs that I found. So, if you click on these, um, you can read more about it. Uh, for some reason. It's still a work in progress, but um, uh, so each of these have um, 
interview transcripts, photography, uh, other resources. And then there's a link here where, um, which is the crowdsourcing aspect, um, where you can log your own project and get in contact. So that's that. And then below here is the f introduction to the documentary series, which I was hoping to play for Please. you guys. Um, see if it. En la búsqueda de los líderes de los biocombustibles aquí en Chile, el camino es sinuoso. La industria casi ha desaparecido después de un gran crecimiento al principio de este siglo. Mi primer paso es visitar a todos los proyectos universitarios de biocombustibles. La investigación que más me llamó la atención era el Consorcio BioEnercet, un proyecto fundado por el Estado. Y como muchos proyectos parecidos en Chile, ya ha cesado sus operaciones. En su día, era un gran conjunto de dos universidades más las tres empresas forestales más grandes de todo Chile. Su meta era crear bioetanol a partir de desechos forestales. Ahí parte la conversación. El país no es un país muy grande, tenemos una población relativamente alta para el territorio y la idea, eh, la idea siempre fue usar algo que fuera más denso que la que tuviera una mayor productividad por hectárea, como es el caso de, lo, de, lo, de la parte forestal. El, como te digo, el tema de, de, de avanzar en biocombustible, yo creo que este país ya no lo va a hacer. Yo creo que le tengo tan poco porque resulta que no hay, no hay leyes, no hay normas. Que, que obliguen a las personas en Chile a usar biocombustible en, en mezcla con la gasolina, uh -huh. ni con el biodiesel tampoco. Si los gobiernos no crean las instancias necesarias para que se implementen con, una, con, con normas y con reglamentos y con, y con, en un comienzo con subsidios quizás. Los subsidios tampoco es la, es la solución, uh -huh. subsidiar el combustible sino que la solución sería de que, por ejemplo, el, el, los biocombustibles, el uso de los biocombustibles sea obligatorio, porque automáticamente se arma una industria y un mercado. En, en términos de los negocios, no, no es que uno quiera o no quiera, sino que en los negocios uno gana más o gana menos. Sí. ¿Te das cuenta? Entonces no es una cuestión... No hay de incentivo, que... entonces. Claro, no hay incentivo. Sí. Es fácil cuando tienes el financiamiento eh, estatal. Hacer todos estos desarrollos, pero cuando había que pasar ya a una etapa de inversión eh, y con mayores confianzas entre universidad y empresa, faltó llegar a, ese otro, a esa siguiente etapa. Uno empieza a ver el problema más, más de fondo, te das cuenta que también es una cuestión de volumen. ¿Ya? Que tú no resuelves el tema eh, recolectando lo, los aceites de, 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 de cocina quemado. Puede resolver el tema para, un, para una persona. ¿ya? Eh, y quizás con, con, una, con un radio de acción muy pequeño, de 40 kilómetros de la ronda. Pero el problema es real de transporte, el problema. Tú lo resuelves con, con, con grandes volúmenes. Cuando hablas de grandes volúmenes, hablas ya de escalas industriales mayores. Y eso ya tiene que empezar a jugar en las grandes ligas. A corto plazo va a fracasar. Entonces, ¿por qué no vas a tener un mercado? No hay una demanda por el, por el combustible, por el biocombustible. No hay un mercado que lo, que lo compre. Por ende, no necesitas producirlo. No, nadie, nadie se va a poner a hacer biocombustible por amor al arte. Aunque los académicos tenían dudas sobre los esfuerzos comunitarios de biocombustibles, yo quería probar que no solamente existen, sino que también están generando una conciencia ambiental. Yo tengo un proyecto al principio de la empresa. Para formar la empresa, debe ser lo más transparente y cumplir con todas las normativas existentes. Como no había ninguna otra empresa en Chile que hiciera lo mismo, o por lo menos no se tenía el registro de que había estado inscrito, se demoraron 23 meses en decirme qué tengo que cumplir para poder colocarme con una empresa que haga vida. Entonces, ¿cuáles son, así en, en su opinión, 
los obstáculos que eh, impidan que produzcan la, eh, el biocombustible. Precio, precio, principalmente el precio. Y también en Chile falta un poco la conciencia de la gente de reciclar. Se está creando ahora, tampoco, pero no ha pasado muchas veces que no, no reciclan el aceite, aunque lo tengan ahí, prefieren ponerlo, botarlo, hacer otra cosa. Bueno, fluye. Pero su pregunta es precio, porque la inversión no es, es alta y el, el retorno es bajo. Bueno, se hace biodiesel de aceite quemado, ¿cierto? Sí, claro. Que la gente en la comuna eh, lo trae acá. Lo ha robado sí. nando, para que nosotros sí. hagamos el biodiesel. ¿Cómo conocen ellos de ese proyecto? Eh, ellos empezaron a conocerlo a través de unos proyectos, Holanda. Mm. Que antiguamente a ellos, por ejemplo, si nosotros llegamos a la casa, le damos de la gente, eh, necesitamos un aceite que ya no ocupa, eh, a cambio le damos unas semillas de planta. Ah. Había como un, un cambalache. Pero ahora la gente, como también no tiene dónde botar su aceite, vienen ellos y los dejan acá en la puerta de adelante el aceite. Nosotros lo botamos. Todavía estaba buscando un programa que enseñar a la comunidad sobre el proceso de cómo se hace un biocombustible. Por fin encontré la Ecoescuela Nómade. Acompañé al líder Fernando Vigor cuando fue a buscar el aceite quemado de cocina en Pucón. No pude creerlo, era tan fácil. Él me dijo que los restaurantes en Chile tienen mucho aceite guardado y no todos tienen alguien que lo recoja. Fernando puede utilizar el aceite que recoge directamente en su furgón en vez de convertirlo a biodiesel como se hace en los lugares que había visitado antes. La gracia del furgón es que tiene una máquina adentro que calienta el aceite y lo agrega directamente al motor. Después asisto a un taller de la ecoescuela sobre cómo funciona el sistema. La comunidad podía aprender el proceso y hacer preguntas con los expertos del sistema. Eso es lo que estaba buscando. Fue tan distinto de lo que aprendí en la universidad. Después, descubriré que la filosofía de aprender haciendo también existe en el mundo académico. was this dichotomy between what they were telling me at the university, which is no one should do biofuels, or no one should pursue this, it's not possible, it's not viable economically, but I was just so convinced that all of these could exist and should exist for reasons beyond just um, tackling the grand problem of transport and other things, because what I'm what I found in my research is that we right now need to be creating a general consciousness around creating new energies. And so um, that's what leads me to my next uh, axis of the project, which is I decided to engage the youth um, with my findings. And uh, after interviewing tons of researchers and other things and finding out what projects were stalled and what projects were keeping going and other things, I decided to um, implant myself in certain communities and share this knowledge in order to spark creativity um, and hopefully engage the youth in perhaps studying or pursuing these projects um, as they get older, either in the university or just directly in their community. So. Um, 
the first, well, I've, I did a sort of a series of workshops and developed a curriculum that uses this um, idea of environmental consciousness as a pedagogical tool for sparking creativity. Um, so what I use is mostly, they're all genius, all these kids that I worked with. So I worked with both kids and adults um, in various cities in Chile, and I will tell you that by far the children are way more genius than the adults. Um, I had them, one of the curricula that I developed, curriculum that I developed was a um, class that asked the students to develop their own uh, renewable energy systems and then create a proposal to apply for it because one of another one of my findings is that uh, there's a lot of state funding out there but not everyone knows how to get it or they don't know the steps necessary so I that was part of the idea of the workshops was to get them thinking about not just this idealism of let's let's harness the energy of the laughter of babies, which was one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the ideas, um, but let's apply for funding and let's actually implement this system in our school or in our community center. So um, let's see, here's a, a workshop that I gave in Santiago, uh, and I taught alongside a Spanish language teacher, um, and we inspired the kids to um, ask questions about their environment using, I don't know if you guys have read Pablo Neruda's book of questions. Um, and it was just really hilarious because it gets these kids to ask all these, all sorts of nonsensical questions. Like, um, who waters the sun in the evening <laughs> or something? Um, so this was sort of creating this experimental pedagogy, um, that I now documented and, um, have it publicly available so that it can, the model can be used in different places. Um, and am I okay on time? Yeah, you have about three minutes. Okay, cool, perfect. So uh, this is another picture of working with students in San Carlos, uh, which is just north of Chillán. And we did a similar workshop where we um, had them design their own uh, energy systems. And um, one thing that I focused on is in one tool that I used was connecting it to the four traditional elements of the earth, earth water, air, and fire. Um, so I had them focus on that and use it as a, a framework for them to develop their own energy that harnesses the, uh, the tools available. So, yep. And then um, lastly, I saved the best for last because this uh, project in Villarica, which is where I ended up staying as my hub is really the nexus of all of this. So it's a, it's a university partnership um, with the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Villarica. And um, what they've done is they've partnered with Siemens, which is, uh, I'm sure you've heard of it, a German corporation. And they've installed these anaerobic digesters in three different schools. Um, what an anaerobic digester does is it converts manure into biogas and fertilizer. So this is a hands-on learning approach that I talked about in the end of the documentary, which is what the next uh, part of the series is going to be about, um, which is really engaging the youth in actually producing their own energy. And so I was able to conduct workshops there. I'm actually going back to do my last one next Monday or this Monday. Um, it's a little smelly, but <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely... Um, I feel like I found sort of the crux of this whole um, dichotomy that I felt like I was confronted with sort of nearing the end of my project um, and found that even though there's a slight lack of biofuel research, there is definitely not a lack of creativity um, in the communities and um, I hope to continue this. This is definitely a, how would you call it, it's a lifelong production, the map and the documentary series could go on for 10, 20, 50 more years and still never be done. But um, so hopefully um, I set up the tools to be able to pursue this from anywhere in the world, but I do hope to come back. So, yes. Oh, these are just a few of the uh, designs that I thought were really dope. <laughs> so.
So here's a hydro eolico solar system that uh, has solar panels on the wind turbine and wow. a transformer and then another turbine that goes into the lake and uh, is distributed through the already existing network. This is um, this is a system that uses solar radiation and um, then reflects it onto the ocean, which then evaporates into this tank of water and comes down to this turbine, is generated uh, through a transformer and then uh, distributed. This is a really awesome project that made me laugh a lot. It was, this was the only one I featured. It was created by an adult. But um, so the idea is this is a bicycle track, and uh, this is a school, so the students can leave um, their class and in between classes ride their bike to charge their own battery, um, which each student is in charge of one battery that they take to the class to power the heating and the lights in the classroom. So I thought that was genius. And then lastly, um, this, this is a, just a system that uses um, sort of more rustic uh, renewable energy, uh, like smaller scale, um, and in order to power a farm and a garden for the community. And now I'll turn the mirror on to you guys if you have any questions. <laughs> This, by the way, I have to tell you, it's in um, Cajon del Maipo, and it's uh, a mirror that basically focuses the rays of sun on one point, and when I was there, I don't have a picture of it because I was so astounded. He held a piece of wood up to it, and it started to catch on fire, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> Any questions? Do you see the, the understanding of renewables getting any better in your nine months here, or is it still sort of pretty dismal? Uh, in terms of the students, they really have a lot of knowledge. They um, also had what I thought would be a challenge was to tell them about um, transforming the energy into, like, kinetic energy into electricity, but they really did have a strong basis of um, that process of transformers and um, distribution networks. So, um, and then also the people who I talked to, like, in terms of the oil, uh, use cooking oil, it's definitely um, increasing consciousness that you can't throw out your oil. And so I think that's a really um, a huge area of potential here because there is a lot of frying that goes on and there's not a lot of uh, regulation around that oil like in the U.S. Um, where I had a um, biodiesel lab, it's kind of hard to get into restaurants because they already have contracts, but that doesn't exist here. so. Um, or at least as far as I know. So. A lot of opportunity. Yeah. Also, I just wanted to thank my family and my partner, Asia, who was with me along this whole way, documenting and being a cinematographer. So I know they're watching the live streams, so I wanted to give a shout out. But thank you, guys. Manuel seems to have disappeared for a second. Uh, I did have a question. So, with the anaerobic digesters, I know it's yeah. like sort of a. Yeah, you company. told me about that at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your question? Oh, no, I'm just wondering. So, um, I, I guess is this sort of like does that, do, or which which of these renewables answers most to the university worry of how do we make this economically viable? Because I feel like in the current kind of capitalist system that we're all kind of hard of, you know what I mean? Like. If you, you know, where's that, where's that cash flow? Right. So, um, I think that in terms of the most feasible option, maybe it's not the most lucrative option, but the most feasible economically is the anaerobic digestion because it's so rudimentary and it doesn't require this huge plant. It can, and also there's an excess of manure and, um, I, we heard, I've heard rumors that there are people um, producing uh, this fertilizer and selling it to farmers and saying, oh, you know, you can double your yield and other things. So that yet has yet to appear on the map. But um, just it's definitely a consciousness that's growing because the fertilizer that comes out of it, I forgot to mention that um, in this particular program, they're applying it to the huertos that they have in the schools. And the yields are really 
incredible. Um, it's definitely something that I'm gonna take back to the U.S. and. It's like it's like triple recycling. It's really. Cool. It's amazing. Yeah, I definitely um, ex expanded my mind when I learned about that. <laughs>